and welcome. Cerebus is an epic story that ran for 300 issues between 1977 and 2004. The entire series makes up one complete 6,000-page story. This is an achievement that makes Cerebus unique in the medium. Certainly, there are many series that have run much longer, but none have been entirely produced by one individual, or in this case, one small creative team. Cerebus was entirely produced by two people, Dave Sim, who wrote, drew, and inked all of the characters and lettered every issue, and Gerhard, who drew and inked all of the background starting with issue 65 until its conclusion with issue 300. Although, one cannot forget the contribution of Denny Lobert, the publisher of the comic for the first 85 issues. In fact, it was Denny who invested the cash necessary to print the first issue. And she took care of the business of producing a comic book while Dave put his energy into creating it. These are contributions that cannot be overlooked or diminished. What's interesting about Cerebus is the evolution of the series from its beginnings as a parody of the sword and sorcery genre in general, and Conan the Barbarian in specific, into being an absurd political farce and then a satire of religion and religious beliefs. The direction of the series shifted again, becoming more serious and literate. This period began with an intimate portrait of the supporting character Jaka, and then continued with the slow tragic death of Oscar Wilde. This evolution concluded with the series becoming a controversial, unflinching, and utterly self-indulgent platform for the creator, Dave Sim. The story of Cerebus the Aardvark effectively ended at that point, and the further adventures of the character became secondary to the intellectual agenda of the creator. It's this evolution from parody to self-indulgent mess that's going to take some time to unpack and examine. First, it may be best to give a brief summary of all 16 volumes of the Cerebus story before discussing it any further. The first volume is the rough beginning of the series. For the first dozen issues, it's obvious that there's no real direction to the comic book other than satirizing fantasy adventure stories. However, once this initial early period is over, the series does slowly become more focused. We meet Cerebus the Aardvark, who is basically a thug that only wants to drink and to be wealthy and powerful. His ambitions are pretty basic, and he just wanders aimlessly from adventure to adventure. But within these first 25 issues, we're introduced to most of the supporting characters that will play significant roles in the overall story. Cerebus finds himself being a pawn in a political game between Lord Julius and his former wife, Astoria. He eventually ends up being the Prime Minister and launching a war that ends very poorly for him. Cerebus is forced to give up being Prime Minister, and he flees the city to save his life. Due to the popularity he gained as Prime Minister, Cerebus is lured into becoming the Pope for the Church of Terum. Those that lured him into this position quickly lose control of Cerebus when he realizes that as Pope, he has the power to tell anyone to do anything and they are obligated to follow his command. In typical Cerebus fashion, he demands that everyone everywhere give him all the gold in the land or face the wrath of Doomsday. Eventually, Pope Cerebus literally ascends from Earth to presumably meet God. He ends up on the moon, where he meets a being known as the Judge. The Judge explains the history of Cerebus's world, and then he informs Cerebus he will die alone, unmourned, and unloved. Cerebus is returned to Earth to discover that a female-led rival church, the Cyrenists, have invaded and taken control of the Empire in his absence. Once again, Cerebus is powerless and alone in a world hostile to his existence. This is a very intimate portrayal of Cerebus's true love, Jaka, who takes in Cerebus following his return to Earth. Cerebus is not the focus of this story, as it centers around Jaka, her husband Rick, and a few other people who live in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere. We learn that the Cyrenist occupation is oppressive, and their laws are absolute. Jaka is eventually imprisoned by the Cyrenists for being an exotic dancer, but she is subsequently released and allowed to return to her homeland. This volume is all about the final days and death of Oscar Wilde. It literally doesn't pertain to the overall plot whatsoever. Cerebus only appears at the end of this volume, whereupon he hears two guards talking about Jaka. This talk throws him into a murderous rage, and he begins a killing spree. Cerebus slaughters a pile of Cyrenists, and inspires a revolution to rise up and take control from the oppressive, female-led church. Eventually, Astoria, Cerebus, and Siren convene to settle their differences and decisively end the conflict being waged. However, the mysterious Suentis Poe arrives and tries to talk them out of the obvious violent resolution they all have in mind. Astoria is swayed by his argument, and she walks away, leaving Siren and Cerebus to face off against one another. 
Instead of talking it out in a rational manner, they fight. This fight triggers the beginning of another ascension. Both Siren and Cerebus ascend to outer space, where they learn more about the history of the world and about each other. Siren is returned to Earth, while Cerebus is brought to Pluto, where he has a conversation with his creator, Dave. Stranded on Pluto, Cerebus is forced to contemplate his choices and the shape of his future. Eventually, Dave returns Cerebus to Earth, believing the Aardvark has learnt some cosmic truth about existence. Cerebus hangs out at a bar, being drunk. Despite being an enemy to all Serenists, Cerebus is allowed to live out his life as long as he abides by their rules and remains in this bar. Jaka's ex-husband, Rick, shows up and mentions that he is writing a book about Cerebus. Then Rick leaves and Jaka shows up. Cerebus and Jaka decide to return to Cerebus' homeland. After an exceptionally long journey, they finally arrive at Cerebus' home, only to learn that his family is dead. Angered that Jaka made him take a sweet time returning home, thus preventing him from seeing his parents before their death, Cerebus tells Jaka to go away. She does. Despondent, Cerebus decides to commit suicide by attacking the Serenists on his own. Before he can do that, he's abducted by the Three Stooges who believe he's a prophet. While in captivity, Cerebus spends a long time rewriting and interpreting religious texts. Then Cerebus starts another revolution. He defeats the Serenists and rules the land until he dies alone, unmourned, and unloved, as predicted by the judge during Church and State. The End Cerebus wasn't initially intended to be a 300-issue epic. It was just supposed to last as long as it would last. The original plan by Dave and Denny was to do three issues and decide whether to continue, depending on whether the comic was successful or not. Originally, the comic was pitched to Mike Friedrich, the publisher of one of the early independent comic book successes, Star Reach. However, Friedrich turned down the Cerebus project, so Dave and Denny decided to self-publish it on their own. Incidentally, at the same time, Friedrich also turned down a proposal for ElfQuest. Thus he passed on two of the most successful independent comics of the 70s. For the first two years, Cerebus was published bimonthly, while Dave worked on other projects to pay the bills. Then, in 1979, once the comic was established and somewhat successful, Dave had a nervous breakdown. The official announcement made by Denny at the time was Dave had overworked himself by doing two issues back to back. The truth was, Dave decided to drop acid every day for a week while working on the comic. This drug experiment didn't turn out so well for him, and he ended up being hospitalized. While recuperating in the hospital, Dave was struck with the idea of turning Cerebus into a monthly comic book. Furthermore, he decided he was going to commit to doing Cerebus for 300 issues. Shortly thereafter, he announced the comic would last until March 2004, and it would end with Cerebus' death. Starting with the 14th issue, supporting characters started reappearing more frequently. The social structure and beliefs of the world became more detailed, and the series started to develop an actual continuity. At the very end of 1979, following Dave's recovery, Cerebus started being published monthly. And just over a year later, with the 26th issue, Dave would begin High Society, the storyline that would signify the beginning of the narrative journey to issue 300. While not an actual controversy, in comparison to the difficulties the series would later experience, Cerebus did run into some legal trouble early on. At the beginning of the Church and State arc, the recurring character, the Roach, assumed the identity of Wolveroach. Marvel Comics made a few legal grumblings over the obvious parody of their very popular character, Wolverine. But, ultimately, no lawsuit was filed. The cease and desist letter sent by Marvel Legal Department was subsequently printed in the letter column of Cerebus No. 61. The main objection was the use of the character on three consecutive covers, which Marvel interpreted as an unfair usage of their trademark. That is, Sim was using their Wolverine character to sell more issues of Cerebus. Apparently, then-editor-in-chief of Marvel, Jim Shooter, intervened and allowed for the use of the parody character by retroactively extending a license to Sim. This ended the matter, and Sim did avoid using parody characters on consecutive covers after this incident. The first actual controversy for Cerebus was the rape of Astoria in issue number 94. The main issue of that scene was the implication that Astoria had been asking for it. She had been manipulating Cerebus for years and, in that issue specifically, she had tricked him into giving her a drink of water. 
More to the point, she wriggled out of her panties, flicked them onto Service's head, and taunted him about his, quote, acquired tastes, unquote. Regardless, taunting is not consent. Furthermore, it's a brutal crime that was treated with a very comedic tone. In that context, it's an approach that is rather distasteful. Over the years, it was presumed that the Astoria character was largely based on the former publisher, Denny Lubert, who had married Dave Sim years earlier and then divorced him the year prior to the issue being published. In other words, the scene was petty revenge. However, Dave denies this was an attempt to get revenge on his former wife and partner. Furthermore, the character was based on Mary Astor, who portrayed a manipulative woman in the movie The Maltese Falcon, thus the name Astoria. So a presumption that Astoria was a stand-in for Denny is simply incorrect, according to Dave. Regardless, due to the social atmosphere at the time, victim blaming was still an issue that hadn't been addressed, so there was a muted response to this issue. Over time, this scene would become a part of the larger discussion concerning the series as a whole, specifically Dave's opinion concerning women. The next controversy, the one that is most memorable, occurred in issue number 186. Within a year or so following the publication of that issue, Cerebus lost roughly two-thirds of its readership. The reason for that dramatic loss in readership was a text piece within that issue where the character Victor Davis, a thinly veiled representation of Dave Sim, addressed the readers directly and put forth a meandering, sometimes abstract rant against feminism and the influence of women on men and on the shape of society as a whole. The core of his position, which bears some similarity to Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, is that reason and thought are superior to feelings and emotion. All men are capable of this alleged superior state of being, while all women are not because they are emotion-based, parasitic beings. It is an opinion dressed up in a very forced metaphor being passed off as a cogent argument. The reaction to this opinion concerning women was, as one might expect, an immediate and definitive condemnation by both readers and by peers within the comic book industry. It was, to use a popular term, career suicide. Even now, 20 years later, it's something Dave Sim has not recovered from, and there's no indication that a recovery is even remotely possible. The final controversy came with issue number 265. Included in that issue was an essay-length rant called Tangent. This is an endurance test for anyone attempting to understand the worldview of Dave Sim. In my opinion, from the few pages I managed to read, it reads like a long-winded, way-late response to the acrimony he received concerning the initial anti-feminist reads installment. Tangent reads like someone desperately trying to win an argument they've already lost. In the end, all he's doing is arguing with himself. If you're so inclined, you can easily find reads and Tangent online. Reading either of them will definitely give you a fuller understanding of the controversy surrounding Dave Sim. Of course, this leads one to the question, what led Dave Sim to use his comic book as a platform to explicitly express his personal views with his readers? All things considered, it was clear he would alienate a good portion of his audience by doing so. Even more to the point, why didn't he simply take those views, put them into an actual character, and explore those views within a story? The easy answer, the one everyone goes with, is that Dave Sim is simply crazy. That's not an answer, though. That's an excuse. And, quite honestly, it dismisses the question itself without attempting to address it. So, let's break this down. Dave had established a successful black-and-white comic book during a time when that was considered an impossible task. Cerebus had won wards and received accolades from fans, peers, and many industry professionals. He was, at the time and for many years prior, an undeniably important voice within the comic book community, especially as an advocate for creators' rights and self-publishing. Through his work on Cerebus, he had elevated the comic book medium to a position of literature worthy of in-depth review and critique. Jocka's story was one of the few available examples that comic books are a legitimate adult medium. At the time he started the Reed storyline, Dave Sim was at the height of his power and at the top of his creative game. He had complete and utter creative control over the content of Cerebus, which is something he had maintained right from the beginning of the series. The storytelling within Cerebus had also been a series of taking creative chances with the distinct possibility of alienating the audience. For example, Dave wrote and illustrated stories that literally took years to complete. He experimented with page layouts and with pure text pieces. He seamlessly drifted between comedy, tragedy, satire, and drama. 
All of the creative chances he had taken turned out to be successful, and he had accomplished all of this on schedule, month by month, year after year. Finally, tackling social issues was something Cerebus the comic had done many times. Whether it was the absurdity of modern politics, or the corruptive power and influence we extend to those that claim to speak for God. It was a comic that wasn't afraid to challenge the reader's views and opinions. However, in the end, the answer to the question, what led Dave Sim to use his comic book as a platform to air his personal views, is this. Dave Sim thought he had something important to say, and he wanted everyone to know it was him who was saying it. It was a bold, creative decision, but it was the wrong decision to make. Not just because his opinions are demonstrably wrong, but because his egotistical need to make a point became the story. He inserted himself directly into the story and used the most effective platform available to him to express his personal views. From that point forward, Cerebus stopped being about the aardvark. It became the platform for the creator to put forth an agenda. The narrative discontinued the illusion of being organic and progressed along a very specific path. Ordinarily, the art and the artist who produces it are two completely separate entities. In the modern age, with the proliferation of social media, it's easy to confuse these two as being one and the same. However, good writers can and should regularly write complex or interesting characters that hold opinions and views in opposition to their own. Again, to reiterate, this is what a reasonably good writer does in service of the story. There is no shortage of examples of good and bad writing in this regard. However, Cerebus after issue number 186 is a rare case where one cannot separate the art from the artist. This cannot be done because the artist is clearly active in the art. Dave wrote himself and his opinions directly into the story, despite there being no narrative need for him to be there. With issue number 186, and with the final third of the series, Dave made sure he and his views were part of the story, so they wouldn't be overlooked. That is, instead of crafting a character necessary to influence other characters, and by extension, the readers, Dave took a shortcut and filled that role himself. As far as one can tell, Dave never revealed any details about the overall plot, other than to repeat time and again that Cerebus dies at the end. In fact, in interviews where Dave is asked about his writing process or the plot to the series, he is evasive and avoids answering the question directly. Or, perhaps more accurately, he speaks in generalities, never revealing any specifics. From all available information, it appears there was an overall direction, but there was never a point-by-point -point plot breakdown of the series. At least, there was nothing in writing. Dave did make notes and character sketches, but it doesn't appear he wrote a plot breakdown for reference, nor did he appear to write actual scripts. A best guess is that Dave worked in an advanced Jack Kirby style. That is, he wrote and drew an issue using extensive notes and the guideline he kept in his mind. While Dave Sim obviously had an overview of where he was taking the series, the specifics were likely not set in stone. Even if one has a grand plan for a story, characters change, situations arise, unintended consequences emerge, and one has to be prepared to adapt to events in the story not going exactly as one planned. Faced with these challenges, a good writer shapes the story being told. A bad writer forces a story into a specific direction, and the direction of Cerebus during the final third of the series is noticeably forced. Furthermore, it seems like the remaining storylines may have been adjusted due to the massive outcry over the opinion expressed in issue number 186, not necessarily because the overall story itself had changed, but because the creator was using the story to further his argument. Or, perhaps, the final third of the Cerebus saga is an artist trying to justify his controversial opinion through his art. And once that direction had been explored, he began proselytizing to a diminished audience, spreading and interpreting the word of God. During this final portion of the run, Cerebus is continually put into situations where women are laboriously proven to be a malignant presence among men. There is no subtlety, there is no contrast. All of the female characters are an unapologetic impediment to male characters, in one manner or another. As an example, while on the journey to his homeland, Cerebus encounters two influential literary figures, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway, both of whom are presented as broken men due to the influence of women on their lives. And in the case of Hemingway, it's heavily implied his wife at the time was so indifferent to his existence that she practically encouraged him to pull the trigger on the gun that took his life. 
While both authors are given reasonably crafted portrayals, their dependence on women is rather one-sided. This is a very narrow, overly simplistic view that ignores other pressures or influences that could have contributed to the men becoming who they became. It focuses on removing, or excusing, the men's self-destructive tendencies by suggesting that women are to blame for these traits manifesting. The character that suffers the most from this anti-feminist agenda is the portrayal of Jaka. In the final third of the series, her personality is altered to fit the view the creator has of women. This Jaka barely resembles the woman we had been introduced to earlier in the series. She appears to adopt characteristics not established in prior appearances. These characteristics make no sense unless they're necessary for the plot to move in a specific direction. In essence, Jaka, the sympathetic, complicated character, becomes an unsympathetic, straightforward straw man. Once Cerebus is extracted from the oppression of women, the comic focuses on Cerebus reading and interpreting the Word of God, which is, quite clearly, Dave's mediations concerning the religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. At this point in the comic's history, the illusion of any actual narrative has been broken. Cerebus is nothing more than Dave's mouthpiece, and any indication of a proper narrative is basically abandoned. If one prefers to be charitable, one could view these issues as the thought process of a humanist considering and accepting the presence of a divine spirit within the cosmos. If one is less charitable, one will likely see these issues as a pedantic, non-narrative sermon that is rather boring. It's essentially unreadable. As an example, nearly the entire latter day's storyline is pages and pages of text with the occasional illustration. It's fascinating only in the respect that it's a document of someone deep inside a rabbit hole. However, it doesn't take long before one realizes the story is going in circles. It's neither progressing nor digressing. It's simply gears grinding and spinning until entropy kicks in, and they completely wind down and stop. Narratively speaking, the Cerebus story begins with the 14th issue and then ends in issue 200. In fact, it would be fair to say there is one continuous story that begins with high society and ends with minds. During this lengthy period, the series becomes very focused and driven by a single narrative, which resolves itself by the 200th issue. The remaining third of the series was related to the events previously established, but, thematically and tonally, the series took a hard shift in direction. What's being told in the final third of the series isn't much of a story, in comparison to the issues that preceded it. It's a slightly fictionalized examination of gender politics and the influence of feminism on society. It's also the mediations of a former, self-proclaimed atheist exploring, accepting, and becoming a very devout religious person. It's obsessive, pedantic, and comes off as the rantings of a narrowly focused person, one who feels compelled to slightly fictionalize and share all the alleged evidence they've collected. That being said, the final 100 issues are not entirely worthless. Objectively speaking, for pure craft, the final third of Cerebus is practically a masterclass in writing, artwork, and lettering for the comic book medium. It is an expressive body of work that is practically unsurpassed by any other example. While the content on the pages is questionable, the actual pages produced are some of the best the medium has to offer. Tragically, Cerebus will always be remembered for the controversies it created, rather than being a literate example of what the medium can achieve. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.